Well, ain't that some shit? Hey, everybody, you're tuned into the number one place for cannabis news on YouTube. Uh, my name's Tom. You might be wondering why I'm wearing glasses. Uh, it's because it's 420 somewhere, uh, especially yesterday. So I hope you had a great one. I know that I did. Uh, and if this is your first time tuning in, we're really stoked to have you. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, White House news. We have some uh, White House federal news about the thing that we talk about, cannabis legalization. Uh, after that GOP Congress, uh, there's some Congress news today. We're going to send some more money to Ukraine. And that has upset people. CBD news. We have Illinois news. Oh, Miggy and I have some interesting news that came out in Illinois on Thursday. Kentucky news. Uh, lots of that. There was some great Kentucky news on Thursday, too. Hey, let's just get into the trending stories and bring on our co-host. Oh, we also have a guest. So stick around. Miggy, you there? I am here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. No, hey, I can nice see you. I'm here. Happy 421. The day after. <laughs> the day that after. is a Method Man album, I believe. Is it? Shit. I think I so. Yeah. By the way, you went to a weeding. I went to a weeding. Uh, yes, I, I was Bert Daffodil. And boy, did we have a great time at that wedding. Uh, really, really lots of fun. This is the only reason I got these classes. Tom's feeling it. He's uh, yeah. His sister got married on 420, which is Nashville have a weeding anniversary every year. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It was 420-24. Won't have it again for another 100 years. Oh, damn. That's right. That's right. So it was that White House news. Okay. Huh? It was the 420 was the same backwards and forwards. Paladrome. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful thing. White House news. White House says marijuana rescheduling is now up to the DOJ after receiving the HHS recommendation. Uh, this has a lot of comments because mostly it was given during a press conference. And so uh, mm. those press briefings are comprised typically 100% of comments. And uh, so that was on 415. They did a press briefing. And the press secretary, Jean Pierre Carney, said, uh, this is a matter at this point, now that the HHS has completed their review, it's in the Department of Justice. They can speak to whether where rescheduling is at this point. Now, this is uh, another what noise coming from the White House, right? More, more possibilities. Did you see what Biden and uh, Kamala Harris posted at 420? I did. Let's share that with the good people tuning in, especially you, sir. Have you lost weight? There you go. No one should be jailed for using or possessing marijuana. President Joe Biden, he's trying to take that fucking quote. I hate that. I mean, it's a love hate, right? Because it's yeah. like the the pretentiousness, and yes, you, we all agree this. But you know, let's go further. No one should be but judged. They, 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 they misspelled um, the founder of Normal Keith Strop's name there. They have it as Joe Biden. Because oh, uh, like Keith Strop has been saying that probably to Joe Biden in the Senate or you know vice president oh, yeah. for 50 fucking years man and now he's like you know what I'm going to do this before I die I'm going to no, say it, my quote too it's a big deal though right the fact that the White House is, is even having a stance they're standing by it they haven't uh, uh, swayed on the momentum uh, rescheduling could be a possibility descheduling however so uh, descheduling uh, will happen, but descheduling requires congressional action. And so mm -hmm. if Congress was not as broken, like funding a war, like a proxy war against Russia, the aggression, that was politicized like that. And so well, I think they're going to politicize the shit out of weed. Hell yes. You you see this every year, though, with Congress doing a job. But here's here's here, here, how, how does for Congress to do the job? Doesn't a bill have to be written up and then it has to be. Uh, uh, presented right and initiated on the floor. So who 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 can make this happen? What momentum ball? Everybody, right? Any of these Congress could be up to them, right? How do we well, walk yeah, through? Yeah, this? we had the CACA Act with you know Senator Schumer, mm. more Act, uh, the Safer Banking, Safe Banking. Has that passed? No, it has not. Good I mean, point. it goes out of like the Democratic House a bazillion million times, but it doesn't actually pass. And so, like, Congress is not you know in the Five years that we've been doing this podcast, Congress has not passed shit, except for the farm bill. And I think they're like, oops. Yeah. Well, but even with rescheduling, which could be a possibly truth, right? That could happen because, you know, the fact that the ball keeps being pointed 
it's like the Spider Man meme where you know president executive pointing. Yeah. Yeah. So like uh rescheduling though could be a, a real possibility within this administration within their with their abilities. Uh it's still it's that'd be a big step. I don't think the fear mongering where it's gonna crush all the markets is gonna happen, right? We hear enough of these stories about like uh everybody struggling in this recreational market, but uh and the reason why I bring that up is because dude, have you seen on uh, yesterday High Hopes and Hulu? Uh, yeah, but I have kids, and so like they wanted to watch the regular show, which is a cartoon ah, with like a one. bird in it, and like yes, yeah, better than Bluey. Hey, sometimes we have to watch Bluey. I do have a three year old? <laughs> oh, yep, but yeah, cute though. And so, um, White House says marijuana rescheduling is now up to DOJ. That's great, and and uh, there was a, a pretty snarky quote at the end of this story that I really enjoyed as well. Mm. Uh, where is that? Let's see. Is that it? Yeah, there he is. Meanwhile, last month, HHS Secretary Xavier Becerra defended his agency's rescheduling recommendation during a Senate committee hearing and also told cannabis lobbyist Don Murphy that he should pay the DEA a visit and knock on their door for answers about the timing of their decision. Uh, it's been six months-ish since they've received uh, Biden's direction on August 29th, and that's usually how long it takes for a uh, rescheduling to happen. And so we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, I, I like this world, though, where they say, hey, lobbies, go knock on that guy's door, because that probably does not really how it works there, right? I mean, it's not like you can just it's show like up. Washington, D.C. is just a big, small town. And so mm -hmm. it's just like Mayberry, except but it's not at all. <laughs> oh, but wow. there's an infrastructure to things. There's a way that this process, and, and unfortunately... Works like the pushback that we're getting now with the GOP congressman that claims top federal officials. Then the, the next one, uh, there's always this like you're, you're saying how Congress is not working forward, like the the pandering with the, the bullshit, the Ukraine stuff, right? Or mm -hmm. even like when they're like, oh, they had a a a, 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 a party um, down in Mar-a-Lago for uh, it had to do with like making it so non citizens could vote. You're like, this is already a fucking law. Like, why is this even like uh, th this just weird thing that these the gaslighting that happens from the Republican Party to their own people? Like, yeah, we're making strides for you. It seems gaslighting. weird. There's probably a lot of gaslighting in D.C. And so, like, if you go to Washington, D.C., somebody may try to gaslight you. We'll see, though. Uh, GOP congressman claims top federal drug official adamantly opposes marijuana rescheduling, but agency endorsed the FDA recommendation. This came out on uh, April 18th, mm. which was a big day for Miggy and I. A GOP congressman is claiming yes. head of the NIDA, that is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, opposes marijuana rescheduling, uh, even though the fact that the agency officially concurred with a recommendation to implement the reform as well as the director's repeated public comments criticizing research barriers imposed by cannabis's current schedule one status. That did not matter to Representative Andy Harris, a Republican from Maryland. And so there you go. There are Republicans in Maryland. <laughs> but it's really hard to just even take that whole party serious, though, when it comes to any of these topics. I... You know, when there's all this just like non-productivity, there's no. I mean, you're telling me like you don't take Marjorie Taylor Greene seriously? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, she is the scholar. <laughs> but she is. Like, it's a good thing we don't have her on the show. We would have a lot of book learning to get ready for then. Uh, we do have a book learning to get ready for after Ooh. 420. We have a guest. And so um, That's right. uh, Representative Andy Harris said during a House Appropriations Committee, hearing uh, that the NIDA director, Nora Volkhoff, is adamantly opposed to rescheduling cannabis. The agency declined to substantiate that position in a statement to Marijuana Moment and instead pointed to the director's past remarks and other materials describing how researchers face an onerous obstacles in conducting studies because of cannabis's Schedule 1 status. And again, just more uh, delay. Like, there's no real resolution to these people. There's no real, like uh solving issues right we we don't arrest ourselves out of addiction we don't we how's it how i've been the through people like benefited from the war on drugs were those that own prisons that's it yeah. 
Well, and now the rehab people, right? That's the other. Uh -huh. That's that's Sam. That's the, the smart approaches against mar marijuana and Kevin mm -hmm. Sabat. Where do, who do you think is paying Kevin Sabat? Rehab. Right. These people don't have real jobs, no real uh, income, no no real toothbrush per se. Like we've we've been talking about, you know, as far as like to, to have that generational wealth, you have to have a product, that have a thing or a of skill set. I mean, that's how I survive. And you survive as a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. I got a certain skill set that luckily... Has put me in a good spot. I got these glasses. I think I'm going to be able to charge more. And this <laughs> shit spenders, your honor. I'm not sure if I'm in the right courtroom. Oh no, no, counselor, you are. Well, thank you, thank you, your honor. Well, I, I think once uh, once we finish this last, because uh, the 18th was a big day for us. It was the 18th like was said, huge. Uh, yeah. We should go to the 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 email that Miggy and I got. Well, I'm just sitting there at work, and so when I'm working, I'm not usually wearing glasses. But I am banging the crap out of this thing. And so, like, I'm sitting there just typing away like a, a trained monkey that I am. And then uh, I, I check my emails after about 10 minutes. And there's a bazillion that have piled up, including this one. Uh, and so this is a reminder. The SECL to conditional license reform for Miggy's Pot Shop. That little gem uh, made it into our email uh, box, the cannabis okay. control section of the Department of Federal Regulations. We were thrilled to get this email on Thursday, filled it out, uh, and hung up, hang on a second, it says, please fill this form out quickly and accurately as soon as feasible to ensure that we are able to issue your license in a timely manner. Please return the form as soon as possible. We, we returned it in an hour uh, <laughs> to ensure that you are included in the first release of licenses. So uh, there is a better then uh, average chance uh, Miggy and I will be getting a license here as soon as possible. That's why I uh, was talking about that Hulu, the new show, because it, it is about a store. And I it, it gave me anxiety watching it, dude, just knowing that we're on the cusp. But also uh, it, the irony where I used to sell weed, luckily never got in trouble enough. But we're about to have a guest that sold weed too, but, but we're about to do it legally. Well, we got to get operational Ish. first, so we got to make yeah. some deals, and we cannot change the equity composition of our license until it is out of the conditional phase. Right. Well, and, and, and but I, we are legit going to be out to be in the business of we. Well, you've been in business. I mean, you're a lawyer person, but I'm I about to honestly sell weed. Voices have been said. <laughs> yes, and so we will. We won't be sending invoices for weed. We will be giving receipts. Here you go, sir. Yeah. Well, we're, we're just gonna have a to be a part of this like evolving animal of legalization is crazy, dude. For me, it just I feel full circle. You know, it comes to this like uh, uh, it started with activism, how you and I met, and then no intention of ever making money or running a business at this thing. And now we got this. And again, the the process though, it's been a year. This is not a fast overnight. No. Quit your day job. No, it is not. Good thing you didn't quit your day job. We would be. Broke. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I didn't this... quit my day job either. Just made my night job pay. That's it. But, um, I think maybe we should talk like uh, a little bit of HR on the show. You know, hey, right. wait, welcome to the HR portion of cannabis legalization news. Don't forget to smash that like button and click subscribe for more of this crap. Uh, should we institute a drug free work policy? Oh, my God. That's hysterical. Dude, I'm telling you, you have to hey, we watch. We got to get those federal contracts, man. We got to get those federal contracts. You have a weed dispensary. Federal contracts, my ass, bro. Yeah. Look, of course, you're not allowed to consume on shift. I'm telling you, but please. Well, yeah, there, there's still anti-smoking uh, statutes on the book, so you're not allowed it's... to smoke indoors in Illinois. Sure. Well, there's still federal, like for, for reason why, for insurance purposes, right? There's that's the problem with this plant's uh the law around it and everything right just uh we live in this contradictory all the time that the goddamn algorithm is against us you know the algorithm you know hey and then what did we do to you algorithm come on right we're just trying to change laws legislatively it's not like we're sitting there and when we're not advocating for babies on spikes like it's not even something that's like we're advocating for something strange. It's like, hey, shouldn't this not be a crime and be a regulated industry? Yes. Everyone says yes. Everyone says yes. What's the problem? Marjorie Taylor Green, dude. Motherfucker. Oh, damn it. I mean, oh, go. thank goodness. 
Hey, if, if you have been hanging on by a thread, good news. It is 20 past the hour, which means that it is 420 somewhere on this planet. Give a shout out to Collateral Base. Yes. Because I work for it and they are paying me to say it. You know what? I was reading a book. Uh, oh, oh, I'm going to take that one off. There we go. Uh, that's, that's, that's the book right there. It's uh, the next run. A UC Berkeley's students rise to becoming a major smuggler in the 1960s. You know what it reminded me of a little bit? Bobby Tuna's book. Okay. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, yep. But um, Bobby Tuna's not here. That's okay. He's passed on. Fortunately, we still have Tom Jenkins here to tell us the story of how it was to be a smuggler 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Oh, yeah, dude. You got to figure it out. Don't we have one button, well, two button. One button, two buttons. Add them to the stage. You do it. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Tom. Thanks, Thanks for man. Me. Happy to be here. Let's see. Am I, is my webcam okay here? Oh, your webcam's reasonably good. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, you, it, you set it and don't touch it. There you go. There you go. Now, hey, you're perfect. Tom, how much weed have you smuggled in your day? Um, probably in the neighborhood of uh, twenty odd tons. Twenty tons of yeah. weed. Yeah. Did you get caught? Uh, well, that's kind of giving away, you know, part of the part of my book. But uh, what? I Wait, left. Well, we let me just say this. Let me just say this. For for the last three, nearly four decades, I've been a physician. And I think that if a person had a felony record, it would be very difficult to become a physician. So that's kind of a sideways answer for you. Doctor, um, uh, in your professional medical opinion, uh, how would you grade the, the medical nature of the cannabis plant? You know, that is a really difficult question. I can tell you from my personal experience, it benefited me tremendously because I was kind of a troubled kid and uh, I didn't really have what I think of as an adequate childhood. So that by the time I was 17 and I got into this craziness, I wasn't really prepared to become an adult. And uh, when I first started using pot, uh, it allowed me to kind of see things about myself that I had been blind to. And uh, so I made a tremendous amount of progress in uh, determining who I was going to be, who I was uh, through pot. Uh, so uh, I assume other people can have that same experience, in which case I think it could be a very, very helpful drug. Now, um, I don't want to, you know, throw any cold water on you guys, but uh, as far as using it every day, I'm not that enthused about that <laughs> but you never know i don't know what is going on in other people's minds and uh you know in medicine we have kind of a joke if someone's in pain we say they have a motrin insufficiency well mm -hmm. maybe some people have a thc insufficiency and, and uh, it benefits them i don't know are you, uh, go uh, ahead are you a general practitioner uh no uh, I'm an internist. Okay. And, uh, yeah, people don't know the difference. So <laughs> let me explain it for all your readers. Uh, a general practitioner uh, does one year in a hospital setting of training after going through medical school, and that allows him or her to practice. Uh, just going to medical school doesn't give you the right to practice. You have to do this one year. Mm -hmm. However, an, an internist does three years after medical school. So we internists are quite a bit better trained than general practitioners. Although some of the general practitioners of old learned how to do all sorts of crazy things. So I admire some of those uh, older guys. Neat. The, the, do uh, people around you know about this book and like you're, what you did? And... It's like you're a doctor. So that, that sounds like a, I'm a lawyer. There's some stodgy lawyers. I would have to imagine that there's a lot of stodgy doctors. And then so you kind of glide into med school. Ah, how did you get yeah. to med school from like running a whole bunch of weed? Like you're in the, you're in the border towns. You're you're flying planes. Looks like there's a lot hmm. of cash. And um, how did you adjust to med school after that kind of 
you know, exciting life. It was very rough. Not for the reason you're implying, though. Uh, I found medicine to be tremendously exciting, but uh, I had not shed my smuggler's personality, which was a pretty hard-ass uh, personality because I had to, you know, I was working in the underworld. I can give you an example that I think is sort of humorous. Um, and my doctor colleagues might not like it, but uh, in the very first month of medical school, uh, there were several of us to a cadaver. And uh, I hit it off with this uh, young woman. Uh, we both really wanted to learn. So we were doing tons of dissecting. Well, there was a third guy named, uh, I should not say his real name, so let's call him Joe. Uh, and he was a bullshitter. He didn't feel like dissecting. He just stood around the cadaver and bullshitted the whole time, didn't pay attention to what we were doing. And uh, to add spice to the story, he had lost a leg in a motorcycle accident. So he was kind of, you know, um, stumbling around the table and whatnot. Well, after our first final, uh, a couple of days later, I got called into the dean's office and the dean said, uh, well, you may or may not know this, but Joe flunked the anatomy uh, test. And he says you and Leslie wouldn't let him use the cadaver. We bogarted the cadaver. Oh my well, I, was upset. <laughs> I tried to explain to the dean, no, we didn't bogart the cadaver. You know, he just didn't feel like working it. But the dean, for whatever reason, did not believe me. I could tell that. Wow. So I tried to get some studying done in the library and uh, it didn't do very well. Then it got to be around seven, the halls were cleared out and I thought, well, I'll go home. So I'm going down this empty hall. I turn a corner, who should be there but Joe? Well, my smuggling personality took over and I slammed him up against a wall and said, don't you ever lie about me again. And at that point I heard footsteps and uh, some researcher, an older guy, was walking down a perpendicular hall, glanced in our direction, did a double take when he saw I had Joe up against the wall, but he continued on. And at that point, I said, uh, hey, Tom, this isn't the way future doctors behave. Uh, chill. This is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I let him down and I patted the wrinkles out of his shirt and said, hey, hey, just don't lie about me and everything will be fine. So that was the kind of stuff I was dealing with. I had to really do a tremendous personality change. And, uh, you know, frankly, I, I needed help doing that. And I, I got the help I needed. So why weed? Why did you uh, decide to uh, transport weed? Like, Or was that specific to just the opportunity? Well, it was the opportunity, but I mean, I, well, my book has a whole, you know, uh, episode regarding smuggling heroin, uh, which oh, I absolutely refused to do. Uh, but my roommate uh, jumped my Mexican contacts and began smuggling heroin. And that uh, is a, a, an important plot point of the book. Uh, so I looked at pot, I, I was a rebel and uh, I liked breaking the law, but I had morals. And I say right in the book, I say, hey, this is a chance to commit a serious crime without doing anything immoral, which appealed to me at the time. Now it's looking pretty, back, pretty good. You know, like, you know, there's a lot of money in the book. And so and, and, and like tens and thousands of dollars. And this was like 50 years ago, right? Like in the late 60s. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it back then? Were you in any circles? Did you know of like, you know, as an activist person who's been, you, you meet a lot of people and you end up like being in the same circles. Uh, have you ever like, you know, with like the, the cults, what was it? The, the sunshine one with the LSD people and all the other, were you ever involved in any of that? Uh, or, or like large cases that, you know, court, you know, type things. Rico? No, uh I never was. I, I was very secretive about what I was doing. And in, in fact, in response to what you said earlier, Tom, about, you know, what would my colleagues think? I have kept this way under wraps. Uh, my kids had no clue what was going on until they were in their 20s. And I told them uh, they were shocked. That's how secret I kept it. And now I'm blowing it wide open. So what the heck? <laughs> um, some people might be like, uh he's just putting us on he's just <laughs> telling stories but um how much was med school back then or like when'd you get out of med school 
Well, without giving too much away about who I am and where I went, uh, I paid $10,000 for four years of medical school. I picked the right school. Yeah. It, it was insane. And I had to play this game where I, you know, pretended to be a resident of that uh, state. Or, I mean, I became a resident of that state legitimately, and that was part of the game. And uh, I guess that state hoped I would stay there uh, and, you know, become a doctor for the folks of that state. Did you ever think about using your uh, your doctor degree to like do some uh, prescriptions, you know, in, in different states? Uh, here in Washington State, it was a holistic thing. It could have been an other way uh, from a RN to uh, an actual doctor, you know, someone with a PhD type. Uh, but you never decide to ever get involved into the markets that way or not? a No, uh, I had mixed feelings about that. Uh, and uh, I, I was really, I picked a really difficult job where I was on call uh, sometimes every other night. And so I had already too much on my plate and I was raising kids, you know, the family. Uh, and oh, yeah. I didn't even really think about doing anything more than I was already committed to doing. Okay. Yeah. Life gets pretty busy. Yeah. Hey, you want to cover a story? Uh, and then we'll come back to continue to talk about the, the book. We have a, a story out of, um, you ever heard of this term, crack use disorder? Anybody? I've got a crack use disorder story that went up Maybe. well in medicine everything now is a use disorder i mean whatever you're using you can make a use disorder out of it hmm. so like crack if you use it you can have a use disorder sure you could have a turpentine <laughs> use disorder <laughs> like everything's a use disorder is that kind of how it works what's the nomenclature for for defining what what afflictions are these days as a doctor well, there's a really strong tendency to try to label things in a very clear cut way uh, that in no way offends anyone on the planet. And so I think use disorder is a pretty bland term that isn't going to offend anyone. And uh, I mean, I had one patient, uh, I couldn't get him to stop uh, huffing gasoline. Uh, the poor, poor kid. Yeah. I mean, I, I think he was just dramatically lowering his IQ, but uh I suppose you could say he had a gasoline use disorder. I mean, yeah. I don't think that's been defined yet in the medical books, but that's but that being called a drug yeah. when I was a kid. Like, don't do huffing. You know, some people will just like sniff glue or, or gasoline and will get you high. So I mean, he treated one of those. Wow. Yeah. You know, this is like also like kind of because earlier I was trying to bring it up was like this is part of the human condition, right? Like when you, we, we, we think we can arrest our way out of things so like like in our lifetime we've seen both the crack epidemic and the fentanyl epidemic i mean we, we're constantly having the opioid epidemic right why don't we just call it the people like to treat things to to escape you know and sometimes the difference is one person has money to pay for court and the other one doesn't and becomes part of the system you know this whole like see we know cannabis in itself helps uh, uh with the endocannabinoid system you know as far as like uh, addiction goes because isn't this more about an addiction conversation and not just CBD, but the plant itself, you know, because this is CBD is a powerful and promising treatment for crack use disorder. Well, just say addiction or, you know, because coffee is an addiction, right? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I need to. maybe addiction's a trigger word and use disorder just sounds way like if it was an ice cream flavor use disorder is so vanilla and boring you're just gonna like gloss <laughs> over it like your eyes would just be like moving on to the next one what's that mm -hmm. gasoline well, Ooh, gasoline yeah. i think addiction has negative connotations and so uh, you know use disorder sounds more benign and clinical uh plus addiction is uh defined in a certain way where coffee wouldn't uh, you know uh, qualify uh, you have you to have, have, what do you have to have for the addictions then, uh, Dr. Yeah. Jenkins? You know. uh, adverse physical reaction to stopping the drug. Mm. I mean, I guess you could say some people have adverse reactions to stop drinking coffee. Um, stopping coffee, yeah, they complain of a headache that lasts for 24 hours. <laughs> what what about cigarettes? 
I mean, tobacco itself is a, an addiction thing too, oh, right? Oh, yeah, that's an addiction. Yeah, no question about that. Yeah, yeah. Habit forming and seeking. Yeah. So you used know, to, you, it's kind of the same thing though, right? A use disorder is where you imply like, I'm just going to not be part of society. Whereas addiction, I'll just not be part of society. I mean, it's the same conversation almost, but with what product, right? If we're talking about crack. Uh, or fentanyl pending you know it's just people use drugs right it, it's not all poor people buying cocaine in the 80s in new york when uh, like wall street and all that shit you know these people it depends on the drug and how people function well it's kind of interesting what you're saying i mean i never thought about this but uh, some people require motrin for arthritic pain mm -hmm. and uh so if they discontinue the motrin they're going to suffer physical adverse effects and i suppose uh, you could say they have a motrin addiction <laughs> which is kind of a silly thing to say but uh i suppose well, they're hopelessly so. addicted to air just hopelessly <laughs> you know, yes. I, if i don't get like 12 <laughs> breaths a minute i, I just, get a little lightheaded but that's it, it's fascinating that we have to brand and and whitewash and maybe that's the wrong verb on that uh anything so that it's just mm -hmm. non-offensive and clinical and boring and that's, I mean, that's why our words are like that now because you just yeah. can't have anything that gets any of your attention well, there was a hospital in Canada that had to change its name five times over the course of several decades. And, and that's uh, not like a comedic setup, like if I've ever heard one in you know, the hospital that changed its name five times in five years. Well, the original name was pretty descriptive, but I guess it was too harsh. It was the Hospital for Ruptured and Crippled Children. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I mean, like, it, it's, it's, it, that's what you do with... <laughs> But then again, that's a very specialized well, child is like broken children. in half. He had ruptured. That's that's why you took them there. Like if your child breaks in half, there's a hospital yeah. for him in Canada. Or at least there used to be before they had to rename it. Now it's probably like children's hospital. Like, well, mm -hmm. I bet you that the hospital for, for, for whole kids is fucking outstanding. But like you know, like that's or where ger germs come from. And what? so like a lot of people, yeah. they say germs are from bacteria. No, they're from children. You get kids together and, and they will get somebody sick and then they'll bring it home. And, and so like, I've learned this from having kids. Uh, they, they go to school where they pass these germs around like they're like they're trading cards or something. And then they come back and they get you sick. And so that was my last week. And like on Friday, and now I'm feeling better. But on Friday, like my phone calls were me just going like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I listened to a couple of your podcasts, and I think a contribution that I would very much like to make, if you don't mind my changing the subject, mm -hmm. uh, is how tremendously different uh, pot was regarded in my day. I, I feel almost like Rip Van Winkle waking up after 100 years. If you might, uh, shall I go ahead with it? Uh, yeah, sure. First of all, the terminology, we rarely use the word cannabis. You know, we used weed, pot, grass. Uh, in my circles, the favorite term was dope. We called it dope. Uh, and uh, if we were trying to be, you know, uh, talking on the phone or whatever, we might use the word merchandise or if I was speaking in Spanish, mercancia. And uh, pot had a tremendous mystique at first. Uh, I'm sure maybe it didn't for certain groups like jazz musicians, perhaps. But in my circles, middle class white, uh, gosh, we didn't know anything about it. Uh, it was this, you know, taboo, you know, really dark subject. And it was kind of exciting. And also we treated it almost like a sacrament. Uh, we would get a lid, we would clean the seeds out of it, and uh, we would get high and uh, read straight out of Freud uh, and other books on psychoanalysis and whatnot. That's and exactly uh, why made it you were yeah. thinking free thoughts. <laughs> can't have that that's why we send them all to schools you start them in the factory program while young everybody's getting your seats quiet tom, or, uh, uh, dr tom not lawyer tom yeah. like i like i i, I like what you're, you're saying as far as the perspective that you had coming up which you know it seems like america as a whole we all kind of like are in different speeds of understanding different things right like like cannabis we'd be one of them you know, you took this time, it was a sacrament, whereas 
uh now it's it's a it's a store and it's uh you know earlier you were saying how like you're not sure about uh, uh someone consuming every day you know and I, I fit that description but also you mentioned that the person who who who, who, who needs that motrin every day right like mm-hmm. sometimes with the endocaminoid couldn't it be argued too that like and this is part of the ignorance the drug ignorance that we have right because i always use the parody of coffee and weed and alcohol all three different fucking things right and then throw hemp into the mix you're gonna get confused people already now you're like oh what is what well it's 0.3 percent defining this uh this thing that's now illegal this 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 saturday night right but overall it's just ignorance because of understanding what the plant does to your own body you know it's it's a uh preacher's daughter type syndrome right where uh you've been denied things and now it's like well what else could be a good time you know what else uh and that seems to me like from your perspective how you were saying how you treated us one thing because you were taught like it was evil almost you know like you know don't do it but now what else well it's gonna be enough how evil it is let's go check out some of this weed. you guys are talking about weed stigma oh, yeah. like this and i'm like you know what we should look at some weed Dr. Jenkins, uh, you've reached the part of the show where we like to look at a nugget of weed and we say, there's a, a nugget of weed. Let's uh, describe it to the audience because about uh, one out of 10 of our viewers are listeners. Yeah. So remember that. And uh, we, we try to describe it. This one has got a lot of red hairs. Um, I would say that it's it's not got that golf ball size. Uh, so not a golf ball sized nugget. This is a lot more of a long slenderer nugget with uh, a lot of red hairs what do you think miggy uh it's, it's a tight little nug that was a uh, uh, hand hand trim tom uh when you were smuggling did you actually like were you selective about the weed that you actually uh transported you're like ah fuck it this all comes in because you're going across state lines or whatever it's time yeah. No, no, I was selective, but nothing like you guys are. And I wanted to come on comment on that because I was very often shown grass without seeds, and I would immediately reject it because that meant in those days that meant it was immature, uh, because the farmers, you know, are under the gun. Uh, they know at any point they may be busted or ripped off, and so they're tempted to cut their plants down before they develop seeds. See, this was before cinsemilla. So it's so ironic that seeds were a sign of quality to me, whereas <laughs> nowadays I don't think you ever even see pot with seeds in it. Oh, it would be lovely if pot came with seeds. But then, like, the problem was that they were all crushed together in a brick. Did they come in the bricks? Did you have, like, those types of things? How did they make those? Uh, well, I ended up making them myself because uh, uh, my contact got very frustrated with me. I kept telling him, do not use any sugar. To pack these bricks and he says well you know the pot won't hold together if i don't use sugar and we argued and he said uh, and this is in the book he says well do you want to do it yourself and i said sure uh, so i spent an entire night with a couple helpers uh trying to pack uh bricks uh, without using any sugar water and it was hard the bricks kept trying to fall apart but we kind of developed a technique for you know wrapping them up in paper before they had a chance to fall apart uh so it was a success I did not know they put, I was going to plug yeah. the book. Where can people pick up the next run and read about your uh, escapades in running grass? Amazon. Go. Amazon? Yeah. Amazon, yes, yes. Amazon. And uh, yeah. I, I, I hope to have I a button. Those oh, seeds from like 20 years ago, though. Like, you know, back when I would get brick weed, they would always have seeds. And, and you couldn't pop them. Or like, I just, I just didn't back then. I mean, like you could have, in theory, unless it was like busted because it was in a brick and it, it smashed the seed. You but, aren't old enough to get pot with seeds, bricks with seeds in it. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah. oh, I was, it was 20 years ago and yeah, Illinois, in, in it was still illegal. Yeah. And so like, uh, because it was still illegal, you had some crappy weed when I was in college. And um, uh, then you also had good weed, but then good weed was still as much as it is now. Mm-hmm. Well, good weed was state weed always, at, the, at least at the time. Uh, let's show that weed again. Let's so show it like it, a, and let's it just a, reveal the strain because nobody, I don't see anybody getting really. No, that's like a general so let's reference. Give a little hint. This is a, a 
uh, an Af African land race. There we go. And I, I think, yeah, but uh, did... Uh, are we going to no, do it? Should we just go to it? Let's go to it and then we'll just discuss it. That is some red Congolese. Uh, it is an African sativa land race popularized in California weaves and Mexican and Afghani roots. More of an indica-like appearance. This colorful palette of land life strains has adopted to their environment over years. Creates a complex profile of effects and flavors. Sativa, dominant genetics, uh, and red Congolese is what the strain was today. Doc, what are your thoughts? It says uh, perfect for morning treatment of nausea, cachexia, tension, or Alzheimer's. Like, What do you think about when strains are recommended for medicinal uses? It's a lot like uh, what you see on TV ads. I think a lot of it's just uh, BS. Uh, but, uh, you know, I never try to tell patients what they're feeling. And I actually taught medicine, and that was something I instructed my mm -hmm. residents and medical students is you don't really know what someone else is feeling. So when they say they take a certain drug or whatever, and it makes them feel a certain way, uh, you really have to try to believe them. Uh, so um, yes, I, I can just tell you on Alzheimer's, uh, sadly, uh, no study shows that anything you do will clearly uh, decrease your risk of developing Alzheimer's, not playing music, not keeping active physically. None of that stuff uh, has been shown to definitely uh, decrease your risk. Which the only risk, the only, the only clear definitive way to decrease your risk of getting Alzheimer's Dying young. I was going to say this. Like I was end your end of flamed out. You know, oops, got in the car wreck. Shouldn't have run that motorcycle that day. Yeah, but Alzheimer's didn't get me. It's about the only way. I mean, like, yeah, you, you live long enough. It's a risk factor. It's a known risk. Screw you, old age. Something about what you said about that brick with seeds. In other words, I've seen Samia came in right around 70 or 71. Uh, because one of my contacts, and this is kind of an interesting story, uh, he uh, assassinated the state chief of police of Sinaloa mm. uh, because the uh, chief had killed his brother. So he it was a revenge killing. And as a result, he had to hide deep in the Sierra of Mexico. And there he met growers and learned all this stuff. And two years later, he was able to pay his way out of his legal problems. And he came up to visit me. And I was so impressed. Not only was he talking about Cinsamia, but he was telling me the exact amount of potassium and phosphate and this mm. and that, the other thing uh, that the plants needed. Uh, so he acquired uh, quite an education in the Sierra. But given that Cinsamia came in, uh, and then when I had a Colombian operation, uh, we only transported Cinsamia as well as the Mexican operation uh, switched over to Cincinnati in the early 70s. So uh, if you could get pot with seeds in it 20 years ago, that strikes me as unusual. No, there was Thousand. all the brick weed that I got. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ohio. Ohio's going to get less of that. Maybe you can still find that crap in Ohio. I'm not sure. Because that's one of the things. Now I bet it's all just him. But uh, Ohio medical marijuana dispensaries are going to be able to make the switch this summer and start selling recreational. The Ohio legalized it at the ballot box, and then they have not changed or deviated from what they legalized at the ballot box, even though there's a few pending bills uh, in in their legislature. Uh, and so, like now, it's going to be the switch from medical shops. So there's about 120 ish. 120 to 130 medical shops in Ohio mm. that are going to start slanging legal weed here uh, this June. What do you, uh, uh, Tom, when you were uh, smuggling, I mean, do you think the world is uh, uh, like, how, how do you see uh, legalization? Did you even see like a, the chance of it happening? Where you, did you even like, oh, one day this plant will be legal? Or was it just like, oh, it's just another part of the system? Like, you know, uh, got to take it for what it is. Oh, I don't think I predicted that it would ever become legal, but I didn't predict a lot of things. I didn't predict this country's, you know, incredible lurch to the right. 
Uh, I, I, yes. Do you guys remember Abby Hoffman? Yeah. He committed Aww. suicide in part because he didn't like the direction that the country was going. And I often think if Abby Hoffman could wake up now, he would be really glad he committed suicide. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, I was right. <laughs> yeah. Get yeah, me right. out of here. I mean, yeah. we are in a mixed bag of, of like, I, I wonder how the, the party that was at the KKK uh, now is like on the other side, the KKK is, right? Like the Democrats started the KKK, but now why is the KKK embrace the Republican Party? There, there's, it, it's a fucking toxic trivia of what is supposed to be America. But also like for me, legalization, because Tom and I, we talked about we're about to be part of a store. I was watching the show and this arduous Ohio, we had Ohio on. Appalachia and they did it county by county and that's kind of like how you make rules happen that's the thing we've been talking about for five years uh just talking about the process you know and hell you as a doctor you know uh, uh you do they teach the endocannabinoid system at all have they touched upon that do you even try and uh, expand upon your understanding of the the because it's entwined isn't it with the nervous system and bone structure and whatnot uh it was not taught in any of the classes i ever took uh, a lot of things weren't taught. Uh, just to give you an example, I was never taught how to treat a sore throat, believe it or not. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Medical education, I, I hope it's a lot better nowadays, although I know it isn't because I taught. Uh, I tried to do a good job, but uh, I, I don't know. The uh, Medical school spends a lot of time teaching stuff that is only going to be helpful to a handful of students that go into research in mm. the yeah, so yeah, law school is very similar. Yeah, like it, you, just, you, you, yeah, you don't want to get me started on the problems with our healthcare system. It would take the next. Oh week, gosh, week, no! Week, but then like, we could do a whole podcast on that because I do not like it either. As as a business owner, I I just don't understand. Like you're trying to incentivize in America business ownership, uh, and then you have the healthcare system. You have what the fuck mm -hmm. is this? But um, yeah, it's messed up. I can just tell you one thing that just really offended me is when I taught at a major medical center, uh, there was no consciousness of cost. And I was trying to get costs down and uh, I was thwarted by the people above me. They, you know, just they didn't feel that that was a priority. And uh, the residents and medical students we were turning out uh, just were brain dead, uh, to use a medical expression, <laughs> when it comes to cost, the cost of the tests they're ordering and the interventions that they're prescribing. Mm -hmm. uh, I always so thought they were trying to avoid lawsuits, and that's why they did them all. But we got a story out of Illinois mm -hmm. and, and recreational cannabis sales tax revenue, uh, 180 million bucks, 180 million bucks in tax <laughs> revenue. And it's losing sales to its neighbor with lower taxes. And so yeah. Missouri has lower cannabis taxes. People go to Missouri to buy their wheat. And uh, I don't know if more supply would bring down the price, I hope. Because like a lot of the Illinois craft grows just are not operational. It's like one in 10 or one in eight, maybe if they have 12% of their craft grows operational now. Um, but yeah, they make a, a lot of cannabis taxes. The taxpayers, the, the thing that scares me about us joining, because the recreational market, the whole uh, regulated market is highly regulated from the bottom up, right? From seed to sale, from the buildings to your, your money flows. And uh, watching that show, I was telling you about Tom, watching these guys, it, it was a very like, um, they, they, they were profitable. They had like multiple stories. They were, they were very, you know, I like, guess we're making money. But then you also see the California news, right? Where shops aren't making it or they say the illicit market is predominant because uh, uh it's cheaper and tax-free but you know uh, people do like comfort right people like mcdonald's they don't you know they still go to the mcdonald's because they don't want to grow it themselves and it's labeled and and, and all the stuff that you you know they they hope is protections and whereas Okay. I'd like to relate a story that I think you guys will find interesting. A friend of mine has been a grower for decades. And so when pot was legalized here in California, he spent about 100, 150 grand to try to become legal. Mm. And at the end, he gave up. It was just too burdensome for a small guy. Yeah. Uh, so he went back to doing black market uh, growing. And what absolutely shocks me is he signed a contract with the Mexican cartel 
And I think, yeah, I'm, I, I think that's really a dangerous thing for him to do, but they supplied the seeds. Uh, they offered to pay him well above the going rate that he was getting. Yeah. And uh, the only condition is that he only sells back to them, uh, that he, uh, uh, well, what, them. what kills me with that situation is what makes them not just say, Hey, come to Mexico and fucking have a grow here. Right. That's a, that's the barrier, right? Why smuggle something back to Mexico when you could just oh, have the infrastructure go back to Mexico? No, they're distributing it. They have, they have yeah. distribution networks. Okay. Yeah. It, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people are going to take the risk. Well, I, isn't Mexico just basically run by the cartels, though? It's a disaster, yeah. Uh, it is, uh, to a great extent. And the current president uh, decided not to do anything about it. Uh, he was going to uh, bring the country up to the point where everyone would have enough money that they wouldn't feel the incentive to join cartels. But uh, that uh, flopped. Yeah, well, so, every time they, they do try, there's somebody that dies. And, you know... Breathing around is a, a big deterrent. You know, this is a completely different discussion, but it's an interesting point. Bukele in El Salvador has used total authoritarianism to prevent El Salvador from becoming a Mexico, and he's been successful. He is the most popular uh, state leader in the world. Uh, he has over 90% approval, and yet he's using authoritarian means uh, so it's presented a conundrum for uh, anyone who tries to, you know, think about the moral way to run a country. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's completely, it's the drug war. I mean, like, what is the cartel making its money in? Isn't it mostly drugs or are they in, are they in their accounting? Are they offering professional services now? Oh, you know? They have diversified. So, which is really sad because even if you stop the drugs somehow, uh, they've already diversified enough that they'll be okay. Uh, they're really into extortion in a big way. Uh, there's a lot of towns where if you operate a store, you have to pay them a, a weekly or a monthly fee to keep on operating. Just like in well, Illinois, we, we get, get that permit mob for, for years. I mean, like uh, it, I don't, I, the mob's probably still out there in America somewhere. Of course but, there are. Just yeah, different. but like, we kind of crack down on it. Like, you well, know, passed laws and started enforcing that. none of us are just because we have a license to deal weed does not mean we're in the mob right well no no but like i said you know those countries have it like that where they have to pay a tax or whatever to do business but also we have to go through the process here in the states right that what makes us different than them and their processes uh maybe i have i have more rights yeah. I know, I know. This brings us to our Kentucky story. All Kentucky right. yes. also dropped big news this week. Uh, and so what 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 makes us different is all this regulatory gobbledygook that we're going to be reporting on right here. You don't see this with the mob. You just see violence. But this is 37 pages worth of rules signed by Governor Andy Bashir that came out uh, on uh, the 18th. And so we were Mercy. very, very, very grateful to see that they are going to be breaking up the types of licenses. They have fees that they've actually disclosed now. So now we have to update all those websites. Oh my goodness, there's so much updates to the websites. I'm telling Jack, Jack, if you're watching, you have to update the websites. And so um, uh, we have 11 uh, regions that will be there. And then there's going to be a lottery. It looks like it's going to be a complete lottery, which is very, very fascinating. I could be wrong on that. But uh, you have to have a complete application. And then if you have that complete application, you can gain access to a lottery. Not sure what the rules are going to be entirely yet, but we got this just gem of uh, tons of info that we have to now process and update the websites uh, and then help people um, apply in lotteries in the great state of Kentucky. Four and a half million people, not one legal dispensary. Mm. Mm. There will be. But this is the process. Hey, Tom, yeah. uh, I actually have guests coming at two o'clock. Uh, I didn't know things would run this long, so I better sign off here. But uh, uh, it's been a pleasure. I wish I could stay longer. Uh, thanks so much for having me. And uh, if you could just remind people of my book, uh, uh, The it. Next Gun, so, 
by Tom Joe. Jenkins. The next yeah. run, Tom Jenkins <laughs> dropped it. And they could buy it where? Uh, Amazon. Yeah. Amazon. It, currently in Kindle and print. And I hope to have an audio available in about a month's time. It'll also be available on Ingram Sparks, but most yeah, of your viewers are going to use Amazon. So, awesome. yeah. Hey, thank you, Dr. Jenkins, for hanging out and, and uh, helping us read the news and learn some things. Yeah. Really appreciate it's it. It's been my pleasure, really. Thank you so much. Good luck, man. Cool. All right. We got, a, we got a shit I wasn't expecting. Why don't we hit yeah. that? And then we got a couple other stories. We'll wrap this thing up. Sounds good, homie. Is out of the marijuana moment. A new federal study shows that are all the states. Mike's coming in now. One second. Uh, is it just me? What's oh, your uh, audio is coming in and out like it does sometimes. I haven't touched a thing. Oh, there you go. Now it's back. See, I had no I idea. Oh, you know, see, somebody else says that Mike was bugging. All right. Oh, my goodness. Hey, I just, I just so had to stop you. you. It's StreamYard. We might have to get yes. off StreamYard. Uh, yeah. Guys, what streaming service is the best? We will ask you on a poll. And so don't forget to answer our polls. What streaming service we use? Because right now we're on StreamYard and it keeps doing this. Like it just, for whatever reason, my mic will just go like. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so anyways, back to what you were saying, though. Cannabis news you weren't expecting. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Right. That was medical cannabis patient enrollment is up 610%. You didn't hear any of that? I said it already. But uh, that is since 2016. This is a new study, a new federal study that shows that enrollment in cannabis programs for medical marijuana has increased, showing increasing acceptance culturally of cannabis, according to a federal study. Uh, and then that says uh, this was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Department of Veterans Affairs and the University of Michigan, which is where they have a lot of weed, by the way, noted that the uptick comes amid increasing cultural acceptance of cannabis, recognition of the harm of the war on drugs. Oh my gosh, that's how dumb America is. You need to fight a war on drugs for 50 years to realize <laughs> that it's causing harm on your own people. God damn it, America. Like, we expect better from you. And so, like, you're going to put you in timeout for a little bit, America. And then uh, hopefully you'll you'll be able to not have to go to summer school. But this is a, this is a wellness issue that we've always said about, right? Like, like, and that's the unfortunate thing where uh, Prop 215 being the gateway to, to, to medical marijuana, showing people like, yes, it does help. But also it's, it's more of like a, an education of, uh, of substances. This, this is not a, a, a fix-all for everybody, right? Like, we just spoke to a physician who, you know, he, even though he's sold, he's not saying, like, I recommend it, you know, because we walk, we all walk a fine line, you know. And here, Tom and I are just trying to say the process can be fixed. You're entitled. You're not a bad human being for consuming. You're not a horrible human being for not consuming. Nobody gives a Just live your goddamn life. Just live so, your life, man. Yeah. Live your fucking life. Hey, you know what's funny? Living okay. your lives. Newsweek magazine. Yes. Newsweek magazine is reporting that the United States marijuana industry has hit an all-time high, uh, still practicing the number one rule of cannabis journalism. Always use puns in the headline. That is the number one rule, cannabis journalism. All puns in headlines. Okay. And so uh, that is the United States marijuana industry. According to Newsweek magazine on April 17th, they had an article. Can you believe it? Leading up to 420 Newsweek had an article about weed. Right. The number of legal jobs is thriving in the industry. There is now 440,000, 444,5 full-time equivalent jobs in the legal cannabis industry, a 5% increase, 5.4% actually, from 2023 and annual sales of legal legal recreational or medical marijuana increased only 10% to 28.8 billion last year because hemp is taking a dent to that. Well, I like that we followed the other story with this, right? The wellness story where more people are using it as a, a wellness issue and there's an industry that's out there providing it that's growing. Right? The uh, 
the cash flows are coming. It's just not like it was where it's like a, the tech industry. And it's also about like running a proper business. You know, you watch that, uh, if, if you watch that uh, show on Hulu, th there's this line where people talk about going corporate versus like the culture or whatever. And then it's definitely changing, right? There's no more Seattle Hemp Fest. There's no more protestables. Well, actually there was this 420, I believe a lot of activists got together on a legislative level but not like in a festival level, you know, you know, besides hash bash, I can't think of anything else that's been predominant hash bash. That's it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the only one Culture. that I really think of, you know, uh, there was the Seattle hemp fest, but, uh, Expedia.com didn't like them. Yeah. I mean, there's just different factors to it, especially when you're a volunteer organization. And the reason that you're fighting is like, it takes the thunder when less people are going to prison when you actually do the thing that you're supposed to do, you know, what if, what, if, what if, like, they actually fear, uh, cured cancer? Do you think Susan Corman would be in business still? No, no. They could, you can't cure cancer. They'll think about all those oncologists that would lose their jobs. But then I, don't, I also don't think you can cure cancer. Like, the human biology is, like, a really complex thing. Prove me wrong, me, in the future. If you're watching this, Tom, 2023, uh, I, like, 2032, uh, yeah. I want you to let me know. Cancer gone or still? Yes. I don't know. Somebody said, okay, uh, that's what true. else is in the news? That was, I believe, it. Isn't that, you know what we should do? We should hype things. Yes. Because right now, like somebody had a question about stuff. Uh, there is an application window, and there's going to be more application windows, by the way. And so the, the, there's going to be a Kentucky application window. There's going to be uh, a lottery there. There's a lottery currently in Missouri. And, uh, and then somebody's asking if a family member can get court records. I believe a family member can get court records. Um, their public record. I think anybody can get your criminal history. Like that's one of the yeah. reasons why, like the the drug war has been so hard on certain people because people ask if you have any like criminal history, or they do a background check on you before they give you a job. Well, and, and so you might have an issue with a pack because uh, they're asking. Because uh, you know, with my three arrests, uh, all tickets. Like luckily, I, I wasn't caught with pounds. I was caught with less than an eighth. And I think every situation. And all personal use, which that was my constitutional defense if I ever got like arrested. Because I, I knew like if I got caught with more than enough, I'm gonna Niggy. Yeah, constitutional <laughs> lawyer. <laughs> you know, but that's the thing about pot smoking. Everybody's a lawyer, and a constitutionalist, and a doctor, right? Like, you know, hey, have you have you tried the the sticky icky uh, pipe express? Uh, it's good for your insomnia. But uh, um, but yeah, Kentucky one of the lottery yeah. social equity. No, I don't think so. No, not uh, yet. I haven't read all the rules yet. The rules are so fresh and so clean uh, that they are not even searchable yet. I would have to throw them into Adobe and OCR them myself. That's how fresh the, the law is in Kentucky. That's that's how I like my law. I like my law pretty much fresh as shit because it's completely unsettled. And then it'll be changed. Uh, Well-settled law makes for real easy court cases. Unsettled law, you don't want to go to court with that. With this document that came out for Kentucky, though, is it? uh just guidance right it's not the actual like this is what you're going to need no it's right? the rule, right? rules the rules this is the, 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 there's form. probably more rules and so like we don't know all the rules yet so you mm -hmm. don't know how to put together a complete application in kentucky but like we put right. them together in new jersey we, to a certain extent we put them in, together in maryland we put them together in illinois we, we new mexico like all these places sometimes they ask for a complete application illinois has not asked for shit uh they can Right. And if they do, I'm ready. I have a complete application in Illinois, you know? Yeah, no, they just got to lay it out, right? That's that's the whole thing about this whole compliance stuff is everything's laid out for you for the most part. And it's up to you to provide. And then again, there's the barriers, right? Like if like uh, they were saying about the, the records, I had all the paperwork from every time I got arrested and plus all the stuff when I did, um, uh, you know, what's, what's that when you uh, do the hours? Uh, community like, service. You know, community service. So yeah, like, I, I I saved all that stuff because I never wanted to be called up again and said, "Hey, you got to do this again," right? I, I knew that much in life, and uh, uh, but to get so I called because one of them I was missing, and uh, they're like, "Yeah, no, we don't have that record no more." I mean, it was a long time ago. It was uh, uh, so like you might have that issue where like depending on what the record is and the level, it might not be still in the uh, uh, system. Which luckily enough, I, I did have the actual tickets though, so that was our proof. Hey, good news. Gipsel. Going to Lucky Leaf in uh, 
Minneapolis. And so come, come, come on, nice. interact with me. Tom, uh, in Minneapolis, uh, this next weekend. And so it, it's like the 26th. So I will be there in a wow, that's a few days. And so it, it's, it's this week. And so nice. I have to go to Minnesota this week. No calls on Thursday. Just to be out of the office. But uh, I'm in the office until Wednesday. And then oh, got to go to Lucky Leaf. Uh, and so we're going to be doing, um, there's going to be a lottery there. I bet. Mm. I bet there's going to be a lottery. Uh, it's coming Good up days. in Minnesota, social equity. We'll find out more about that. We just found out new stuff about Kentucky. Uh, what days? It is the weekend. I want to say it is the uh, Friday, the 26th, Saturday, the 27th. That is the Lucky Leaf Expo in Minneapolis. I will be there. I'm hopeful that it will be fun. Are you going to have a booth? Yes. Very dope. I mean, those, that's the best uh, way to do anyway. the Mita podcast there. And so, like, oh. there's another podcast called Mita. You've met them. Um, yes. And so, yeah, we're going to we're gonna do that. Um, and and then the next one might be in Peoria. We'll see. So we're going to have to have Miggy down to Peoria because we do yeah. have to get the dispensary open. You can do a little pitching for investors for us. You know, be like a little hustling. I mean, you want to shake a little money uh, maker? I've already, I, I know. Um, the, the offering is it, it's very private. And so, like, it's only going to go out to my network, not the, the channel. After it works, then maybe yes. I'm like, here's what we did. Uh, one of those types of videos. But people don't really yeah. care. Like, people care more. There's a new video coming out that I think people will like. About how they can know more than cannabis legalization. If you check that one out. Go, go, go check that out. That one's good. Uh, there's another one of those coming up, and then I'll have more educational material too. Wow, I love it. You, you, you're putting up knowledge. It's all that matters. Yep. Tune in next week. And if you're a member, put you in the credits. Thanks for joining.